You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Today we begin a new series, as Ken said. We will be working our way through First and Second Peter. I've actually been planning for a while uh, for this series at this time, um, although I think the reasons that may be before us now that make this pertinent, I think, are better than the reasons I had when I was originally thinking about it. Um, and what we see, I believe, is as we look at opposition to biblical authority and inerrancy, inerrancy being that the Bible, as God's word, is without error. Now that is under attack more and more, and uh, I think it's been escalated uh, recently as well, that attack. For the world, though, has always opposed God and his word. The, the church in the West, and I would argue specifically in the United States, though, has been living for some time in unprecedented time period within church history, where we have not felt the kickback from our culture and the government but we now are in a time that many have called a post-Christian culture, which is really a post-cultural Christian culture, not that it was true Christianity. And we've seen over just the last few years rapidly growing disregard for a biblical morality. With the denial, going all the way back to the denial of absolute truth in order to embrace a moral relativity that extends to one's sexuality, and even gender identification. And as of lately, this has been predominantly where the battle lines have been drawn against biblical Christianity. As a world that fights to silence Christians and indoctrinate our kids to throw off the fetter of God's authority over their lives and embrace every wicked deed the world considers good. When God by his word, has laid out his plan for sex and marriage and has made it clear that he has made mankind male and female. And we have no right to oppose God, to oppose our creator and reject how he has made us and reject his plan for sex within the bounds of marriage, marriage as he has defined marriage, as between one man and one woman, committed together in the marriage covenant relationship till death do they part. Again, over the years, there has been an increasing opposition to these truths and an increasing risk to speak these truths as truths and authoritative for people's lives. In Canada, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, a bill last month went into effect which outlawed conversion therapy for the LGBTQ plus community. Now, as I understand what was originally referred to as um, conversion therapy, that is something we would stand against. That is something we would say that is wrong. That psychological tool, psychology tool, uh, is not a good thing. Uh, but the bill in Canada, known as Bill C-4, gives such a broad statement on what is being outlawed that this bill encapsulates more than just conversion therapy. I'd like to show you just the, the introduction uh, to this bill. It said this, Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to the persons who are subject to it, Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because, among other things, it is based on a, is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identity, and gender expression. And so just in the introduction to the bill, this calls what is biology, basic science, a myth. And more than that, it calls what is biblical truth, 
a myth. And again, going through the bill in its broad terms has made essentially the call to repentance a criminal offense in Canada, punishable by fines and imprisonment. And so the Sunday after this bill went into effect, uh, which then would have been January 16th, uh, many pastors in Canada joined together to protest this bill. And through John MacArthur, uh, many American pastors joined them as well in preaching that Sunday on biblical sexuality. Now, as we talk about this, we might think, yeah, all right, but that's, that's Canada. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's north. It's, it's cold there. But there are states in the United States that have already passed similar laws. California and New York, to mention uh, a few. And also, similar laws have been being pushed for in Pennsylvania over the last few years. And according to the News Channel 27 out of Harrisburg, 12 cities and two counties in Pennsylvania already have similar laws. And so if we want to say, listen, this isn't something that's going to affect us, this isn't something we really need to worry about, I think we're being a little naive. I think we need to think about it. Because this is something that if we need to deal with it, that when the time comes to deal with it, it is going to affect us. It's going to affect the gospel proclamation. If we're going to take the gospel out, we need to recognize we'll be affected by this. And listen, I'm not saying it's going to be next week or next month or later in the year or next year. I'm not saying it's not going to be then either. I don't know. And to what degree? I don't, I don't know. But as the world opposes our king and his word more and more, and so they come against his disciples, we need to be prepared to know how to respond. Think well. I mean, sure. How we can respond? There's a few ways. I mean, we can we can avoid certain passages in Scripture, right? Or we can just preach a more subtle gospel. Maybe not take the gospel outside of our four walls. I mean, we can we can do that, right? No. That's that's not an option. That's not how you and I were saved. Someone was loving enough to point to us God's law in order to reveal our sin and so reveal our need for a Savior and then point us to that Savior. Someone had to do that for me, and I am so glad someone did that for me, that they would love me enough to do that. So you just have to see our need. We have to recognize that under God's law, we are condemned sinners. And if I justify my sin, if I declare my sin good, then I will not turn to Jesus and find that he is good. I will not seek a savior for righteousness because I'm going to think I already have righteousness. If we do not uphold God's standard, we're really not loving others. We will not point them to Jesus. Because there is hope. There is forgiveness. There is righteousness revealed in the gospel for those whom the Spirit has brought conviction in the proclamation of his word. And no matter what anyone's sin is, and we can say that about ourselves, no matter what about my sin, Jesus is still mighty to save all who will come to him in repentance and faith. He makes the totally depraved, utterly defiled, which all of us are apart from him. The totally depraved and utterly defiled, he makes clean. Clean because of his shed blood, made righteous in his righteousness, and empowered to go to war with whatever sin remains in us. Because we see our Savior is glorious. We see that he is worthy of us fighting against our sin, hating our sin, that we've seen the love that he has had for us. We love him in return, and so now we hate what he hates, which is our sin. 
We live lives seeing how great and glorious he is to please him and honor him because he's worthy. We should note here, Christians do not hate the lost because we were lost. We were lost. We hate the agendas, we hate the systems, but we love people and desire to see them be saved. We recognize that we were once that, in that same place. And it's not because of anything about ourselves that we're not, it's only because of Christ. It's like what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, such were some of you. And we can all say that. And yet someone desired for me to be saved and so upheld God's standard of truth to me and pointed me to the only way of salvation. And this is what the Lord commands us to do. He commands us to. And so whatever angle is taken, whether it's these things that we've talked about and and what the government might outlaw against us and tell us what we can say and not say, or, or if it's some other angle that comes in and tells us that our gospel proclamation is too exclusive, it can't just be Jesus is the only way, or, or whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. We know what our Lord has called us to. And we need to stand on that truth and uphold that truth and proclaim that truth. Our Lord commands us. What else can we do? You might say, but there could be risk in that. The day could come when that's a risky thing to do. Yes, when obeying our Lord is risky, what do we do? Well, we accept that it's risky. Whatever the case may be, for those pastors who preached a few weeks ago in Canada to proclaim that they will not step back from God's word, that was a risk. But we must live our lives for our glorious king, even if that means risk. Because he's worthy. And when the gospel is under attack, when the truth of God's word is under attack, we must address it and speak the truth. Uh, John Calvin said, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. And he's right. As Christ's church, we are commanded to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as we see in Luke 24. Whether homosexual sins, whether heterosexual sins, whether lying, stealing, blasphemy, drunkenness, false doctrine, idolatry, abuse, we must call all to turn to Jesus to be saved. As someone so lovingly called us in our sin to turn to Jesus to be saved. We must do this very thing and continue to preach the truth. No matter what no matter what circumstances change around us. No matter what our government may tell us. No matter what culture may say. No matter what the risk and the consequences. And listen, whether you think this is a long ways down the road, maybe not even within your lifetime. Maybe. But we don't know. And to what degree will this come? I don't know. I'm not claiming that I do. But in any case, we need to settle our theology on persecution now. We need to settle what the godly response should be to a world that hates us and settle that now. If we try to settle that in the midst of going through persecution and suffering, it's going to be a lot harder to get our feet planted on the ground. But we got to get ready ahead of time before it comes. And no, the world will hate us. Jesus said the world will hate us because they hated him first. And a servant's not above his master. But we have to make note, why does the world hate us? We're talking about the world hating us because of Christ, not the world hating us because we're hateful, not the world hating us because we're acting ungodly because we're being wicked ourselves. The response to the world hating us because we are being sinful is repentance. 
We need to repent then. But we're asking the question now, how do we respond to a world that hates us because of our allegiance to Christ? Because we will follow him and obey him above all else. What is the godly response? Just, we need to know what the scripture calls us to. And so in the following weeks, we're going to start off by going through 1 Peter. Because in this letter, the Apostle Peter was writing to Christians who were facing persecution, and not just persecution, but suffering in many ways. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6 says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Again, so how should we respond to our trials, whether persecution or any variety of thing that we can suffer through? We must prepare in biblical truth now. Now, you may be saying, but there's ways in which I'm already suffering. And the things I'm going through in my life and my circumstances. But then you should be asking yourself, how does God call me to respond now in my suffering? And we ask the question in recognizing that he is worthy of us living our lives, even in our pain, to honor and glorify him. That he and his purposes has allowed us to go through whatever we're facing so that we can show how great and how mighty and how glorious he is. And he is worthy of that. So what we see in 1 Peter is that we should respond by being holy and standing firm. Many argue Peter was written, that he wrote this letter between 64 and 65 AD, just after Nero burnt down a great portion of Rome in July of 64 AD. And then he blamed it on the Christians, sparking empire-wide persecution. There are others who argue that this was just before that, somewhere between 63 and 64 AD. And Peter was addressing Christians who faced a more localized pocket of persecution. I really think the evidence of the text points us to Nero's persecution of the Christians. But in any case, he wrote this to suffering Christians and how they should respond. And so as we start now to talk specifically about First and Second Peter, uh, let us turn there and let us begin to read chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. You see here, the letter claims to be written by Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So one of the twelve disciples, really the, the one who stepped out as the, the leading disciples, as, as some have put it, the, the first among equals among the apostles. And there are some, though, who have challenged this, that Peter actually wrote this letter, and so challenged the authority of the letter, although that's only been in recent years. But I still think it's important to touch on, and it can be helpful to us. One, we should understand the background of the passages of Scripture we're reading. We should dig into who wrote it and who they wrote it to and what are the circumstances to understand the context so we know what the author intended to say. That should be part of all of our study of Scripture. But also, two, Challenges to our faith and, and our trust in the Bible is not something that's new for many who have attended here. And so my hope is that as we talk about different things like this, even if we don't touch on a specific challenge that you run into, hopefully you'll be encouraged that there are answers to the challenges you face. And so for the sake of time, I'd like to just give one example here uh, for First Peter and Second Peter, really. Now we see here that there are those who claim that this could not have been written by Peter because the comprehensiveness of the Greek that is found in this letter could not have been written by an uneducated fisherman, as Peter was. But Edmund Cloney points out in his commentary 
that Peter's Greek, 1 Peter's Greek, is not as polished in style as has sometimes been suggested. And he goes on to say, the charge that Peter's Greek must have been minimal and lacking fails to take account of the bilingual culture of Bethsaida in Galilee, which is where Peter was from. But really, too, as we look through this letter, and we come to chapter 5, verse 12, we see that Peter used Silvanus, or Silas, as a secretary, to whom he likely then dictated this letter to. And that was a very common practice in the Greco-Roman era. Really, though, it's Second Peter which has gone through history having the most scrutiny of whether or not this was truly written by the apostle. Second Peter starts out by saying it was written by Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Simon was Peter's given name, and then Jesus gave him the name Peter, meaning rock, after Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, in Matthew 16. But some look at the difference in the Greek, and they say, well, if Peter really wrote 1 Peter, then he could not have written 2 Peter. But there are, again, reasons why we might see such a difference that are reasonable and understood that should not cause us to jump to the conclusion that this can't be by Peter. One, again, Peter used Silvanus to write 1 Peter. Maybe he wrote 2 Peter himself. Or maybe he used another secretary to write 2 Peter. We can't just jump to conclusions to fit our, our own narrative or our own desired understanding of the passage to reject its authority. There's every reason to believe these are authentic letters, and we do believe so. We hold these as they are, as God's word written by his apostles. Now, the closing of 1 Peter, there in chapter 5, verse 13, it says this, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And it would be reasonable to think then, reading this, to say that this greeting is from a church in the city that Peter is writing from, since he is sending their greeting along with his letter. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to get into all the options there are to say, well, what is in reference here to Babylon? There are many different uh, possibilities, including Nebuchadnezzar's city, this uh, very one that took uh, Judah into exile. Although that is likely not the case, the ruins that it was, and we see as we continue to read through 1 Peter that it would have had to have been a place where Peter met up with Mark and Silvanus as well, and so the likelihood of it being that city is very minimal. But again, out of all the options, the most likely one is the fact that this is a reference to Rome, and that it was a way of safely referring to a church in Rome without giving away the location of believers in a time of persecution. But as we see here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he was writing to those who are elect. First off, those in the church that Peter is writing to, we see here then, are God's elect or God's chosen. Those who were numbered among the local church in this letter addressed to them. So were because they were numbered among the universal church, because they are saved are therefore those who have been chosen of God. Because, my friends, salvation is of God through and through. I was not good enough. I was not smart enough, aware enough, able enough to place faith in Jesus Christ because my sin touches every aspect of me apart from his grace. Apart from him, I am totally depraved and unable to put faith in Christ. It is nothing of me but of God's sovereign election, his sovereign choosing by his grace, calling a people out of the world for himself, that he would choose me, that he would choose you who are saved. We can't get away from this in Scripture. It is plain and clear in both Old and New Testament that God chose those whom he would save for his purposes. And I love what Charles Spurgeon says about this. To just reflect on that and think, God chose me. 
he chose me. Why, why? I have no answer to why, because there is no answer. He, he chose me. And you can say the same thing if you have trusted in Christ. He chose you. So I cannot say, hey, I, I believed. I did my part. Look at that. I did my part. I can't say that. For he has awakened my dead heart in the power of his spirit that when I heard the gospel, he created faith in me for his glory. He gets all the credit. And the Bible does not teach that God looked through the corridors of time to see who would seek him and so who would choose him and based on that chose whom he would save. But he chose us before the foundation of the earth to be holy and predestined us for adoption as sons in Jesus Christ, which is what Ephesians 1 verse 4 says. And so his choosing is based on nothing but his own choosing. And I know this is a controversial point, but again, we, we can't get away from it in Scripture. It's what it says. And so Peter says this of them. He, he, he identifies them this way, as God's elect, as the chosen. And they are chosen, as we see here, chosen exiles, as the English Standard Version puts it. Uh, the Greek word refers to those staying in a strange or foreign place. Some translations say alien. And this is how the Bible, again, describes God's people. To live in this world in our, our natural selves, we live among our own people. We're natives in our natural selves. Naturally, we are God-haters, living among God-haters. We are children of wrath, living among children of wrath. But we'll see there in chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 Peter, that God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, that we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ, that we are citizens of heaven now. And so we are here as foreigners or exiles, here to proclaim the excellence of him who called us, as we'll see in 1 Peter. Now, next we see Peter furthers this description. He, he says that the, to the elect exiles of the dispersion, at least that's how the English Standard Version translates it. Some translate it as those who are scattered throughout that area of Asia Minor in those regions that he lists. Here again in the English Standard Version, it says the dispersion, and, and that's with a capital D. And it refers to the Jewish dispersion by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Now elsewhere that we see this word in the Greek in, in the New Testament, found in John chapter 7 and James 1, those places are clearly referring to that specific dispersion of the Jews. And in the Greek, that word has a definite article, clearly referring to that specific thing. But here there is no article. So I, I don't think that we should attach this to that specific dispersion, but that this is simply saying that they are scattered throughout, throughout Asia Minor. And God's church was scattered throughout Asia Minor. God's church was scattered throughout the world. God's church is scattered throughout the world. That we would proclaim the gospel and serve our king where we are. That we would be his witnesses. I mean, even here, as we gather together in one local place, when we go out from here, there's a great sense in which we're scattered. Even just us here. That we go to all different places where we live. We go to Honesdale, we go to Carbondale, Greenfield, Mayfield, Archibald, German, Jessup. Uh, I don't know, if, if I missed your, your place at home, I, I apologize. Uh, but we're scattered in a sense that we would proclaim the gospel and serve our Lord where we are. And that those Peter wrote to were scattered in this region. Most of this area is today modern-day Turkey. And it was an area when Paul was, or Peter was writing to it that had great 
Greco-Roman influence. And these would be churches that were made up of both Jews and Gentiles, but it's likely predominant churches that were predominantly made up of Gentile believers. And when we look at 2 Peter, we'll see in chapter 3, verse 1, that Peter says that that letter was his second letter. So if that refers to this, 1 Peter, as the first letter, then that would mean that 2 Peter had the same audience as 1 Peter. Now, as we continue here in verse 2, we see that God chose them according to his foreknowledge. Now, that's, that's how some look at election, right? Again, God looked through the quarters of time. He had this foreknowledge. He knew who would choose him, and so based on that, he chose. But that's not what the word says here. If you were to look up this Greek word in a Greek-English lexicon, you would see one of the definitions is to be uh, is predetermination. Uh, this is a word about planning ahead of time. Th- that's what's in reference here. Matter of fact, too, we, we see this word in verb form in chapter 1, verse 20, and it's in reference to Christ and his redemption. So we should ask, did the Father just look through the quarters of time to see Christ would accomplish redemption, or did God plan from eternity past to redeem sinners in Jesus Christ? Which is it? Clearly from scriptures, this is the plan of salvation, right? The eternal plan of salvation. Actually, in the New International Version, it translates this word there in chapter 1, verse 20, as chosen. And so we see this this planning, a planning to have a relationship with those who are his, this planning, this choosing of you, choosing of his people, we see there in verse 2, is in the sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification here refers to our positional holiness, that we have been set apart by the work of the Spirit. The Spirit who makes our dead hearts alive, our spiritually dead hearts alive, who empowers repentance and faith, having regenerated us, giving us new birth. We are set apart. And this is clearly what's in reference here. As we see the next thing it says, that the work of the Spirit is for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with blood, with his blood. Notice, obedience to Jesus and sprinkling with blood, go to, his blood go together. The work of the Spirit is unto both these things. And so both refer to salvation. Obedience to Jesus, your Lord, whom through the gospel commands you to repent and believe. Jesus, whose sacrifice cleanses you from your sin. The Spirit has set you apart who believe, to believe the gospel, and be forgiven of your sin. And so, my friends, have you turned from your sin to Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in his perfect life, death, and resurrection to forgive you of all your sin so that you may have a right standing before God, to have the glorious promises of eternity with your great and awesome God, to escape his wrath, resting in the fact that Jesus has settled that wrath in your place? Look to Jesus now if you have not. Look to Jesus. Only he can save. Only he gives you a right standing before God. Trust in Jesus and you will be saved. That's the call. That's the call to obedience. That's the forgiveness of your sin in Jesus and Jesus alone. And then Peter closes his greeting to the church, this church that's in need, this church facing trials, this church in great pain, saying to them, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. As we'll see in this study, in the face of persecution and many trials, Peter calls God's elect scattered throughout Asia Minor to be holy and stand firm. And in calling them to this, we will see he will point them to the great salvation God has accomplished for them that Christ has purchased, and therefore Peter reminds them of their future hope, of their future inheritance secured in God. Believers in suffering, we see that they follow their Savior's example. Peter reminds his readers that salvation is secure in Christ, who paid the debt for all of our sin, paid it in full. 
We see in chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Peter makes it very clear that we are to live for righteousness. And so our suffering should be because of our righteous living, not because of sinful and foolish living. We are to obey Christ's commands and proclaim the gospel that, is, that has been given to us, proclaim the hope that is given to us. We see in chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We'll see in chapter 4 that in light of Christ's suffering in triumph, believers should be willing to suffer knowing that triumph is on the other side. And Peter speaks a word to the elders in chapter 5, telling them how they should lead. And he calls the church to submit to those leaders. And we see here in Peter that believers should not be taken off guard by suffering. Again, we've lived in an unpre unprecedented age in, the ch in church history that we have felt little to no suffering because of our faith in Christ. And so maybe we would be taken off guard when suffering comes, but we shouldn't be. That is the normal experience for the Christian throughout the world and throughout church history. And so Peter warns them, don't be taken off guard, but to be alert, be watchful. In chapter 5, verses 8 to 9, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Again, throughout the world. So I really have a hard time thinking this is just a limited pocket of suffering in that area of Asia Minor. Uh, I think this refers to the suffering under Nero. But we not only can face and will face times of persecution or suffering in which we must be holy and stand firm in response, but also we have to understand the threat that we face when it comes to false teaching. False teaching that is everywhere, all around us. It's a real threat, and in the face of that threat, just like in the face of persecution, we must also stand firm. We've seen so many, it almost seems recently as a trend, those who have deconstructed their faith and reconstructed a new faith which, as many have pointed out, the Bible calls that apostasy, that they've turned from the true faith. And they would love to take you for the ride. We've talked and warned about the self-help preaching in books that are out there labeled as Christian books that malign the gospel and make it all about you and what you do. We've warned against the prosperity gospel, as if God's will is for you always to be wealthy and healthy, and if you're not, it's because you don't have enough faith. It's evil and wicked. And there may be many aspects of false doctrine that's out there that we may easily be able to identify and say, yeah, I know that's wrong. I mean, pfft. But there are also those out there that are so crafty in mixing in enough truth to be deceiving that it is hard to understand unless we know the word of God unless we stand firm and are taking in God's word regularly and understanding it. We have to know what God's word says and stand on what it says. Hold to, stand firm on what it says. As we take hold of the warnings that Scripture has for us. So we will go through, not just First Peter, but Second Peter as well. Peter writing his second letter, probably somewhere around 67 to 68 AD, shortly before Peter was martyred. And he writes this letter knowing the dangers the church faced. So we'll see Peter sought to press his readers to maturity in their faith. And we should all be pressing 
to greater heights of maturity in our faith, in our walk with Christ. We see in chapter 1, verse 13, that he sought to remind his readers of his teaching. And he set forth the scriptures, the Old and New Testament, as the authority of their faith. And he called them to stand firm in the face of false teaching. He pointed the church to Christ's return to spur on their holy living. And finally, Peter encouraged the believers to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what we must do as well. My friends, whatever is down the road, I don't know. Whenever persecution might come, I don't know. Whatever any one of us might suffer, to whatever degree we suffer it, I I don't know. But whatever happens and whatever comes, our hope is in Christ and in Christ alone. We must stand firm in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone, holding up his standard on the truth of his word alone. Christ is where our hope is found, and that's exactly what we're going to sing. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. And that is exactly what we must do. We must stand and stand firm. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nvbc.com.